All right, everybody, welcome back to the next lecture, We're starting off with a multiple choice. So as always, please hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is A. So let's take a look at gluconeogenesis, specifically focusing on the irreversible enzymes and their roles in this process. So first is pyruvate carboxylase. This is found in the mitochondria and is needed to convert pyruvate into oxaloacetate. And this step requires ATP and biotin as a cofactor. Now, do you remember what activates this enzyme? That would be acetyl-CoA. Now, PEP carboxykinase is next. PEP is phosphenopyruvate. And this enzyme is found in the cytosol and it converts oxaloacetate into phosphenopyruvate. This step requires GTP. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is another cytosolic enzyme, and its job is to convert fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. Now remember from earlier that this is activated by what? By citrate, and inhibited by what? Two things, AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Now your final irreversible gluconeogenic enzyme is glucose 6-phosphatase. That converts glucose 6-phosphate into what? Into glucose. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, another multiple choice question. So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's talk about the HMP shunt, which is needed to create NADPH and ribose. Now that NADPH is needed for reduction reactions, cholesterol synthesis, and fatty acid synthesis, whereas the ribose is needed for nucleotide synthesis. Now there's two phases in this pathway. We have the oxidative and the non-oxidative phases or reactions. Now don't forget which of these is irreversible. That would be the oxidative portion. Now which of these happens in the cytoplasm? That's a trick question, they both do. Don't forget that. Now in the oxidative reaction, glucose 6-phosphate is converted into 6-phosphogluconate. That creates an NADPH molecule in the process. Then 6-phosphoglycerate would be converted into ribulose 5-phosphate, again creating an NADPH molecule as well as a CO2. Now as a whole, this phase gives us two NADPH molecules, one CO2, and it uses one molecule of water. Now once we've got our NADPH, we're going to look into that non-oxidative phase of the shunt, uh, which don't forget is going to be a reversible phase. Now the ribulose 5-phosphate that we made in the oxidative phase, that can be converted into ribose 5-phosphate via the phosphopentose isomerase enzyme. Now this ribose 5-phosphate can then go on to create whatever we need. So for example, it can simply go to aid in nucleotide synthesis, or it can be converted via transketylase to either uh, fructose 6-phosphate or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now there's a really important enzyme in the HMP shunt that's always tested due to its genetic uh, associated condition. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, what we're talking about here of course is the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. This is inherited how? X-linked recessive. So remember, when we're deficient in this enzyme, we can't make NADPH. As a result, we have an inability to reduce glutathione, and subsequently, we put red blood cells at an increased risk of being damaged by free radicals. Now, this results in red blood cells being susceptible to oxidizing agents, um, medications, certain foods. What's a classic food? Fava beans. Now, the consequence of this ultimately is going to be breakdown of that red blood cell, hemolytic anemia. Now, do you remember when we're dealing with hemolytic anemia, what types of bodies and which unique types of cells we will see. We'll see Heinz bodies, which remember, these are seen as a result of denatured globin chains precipitating within the red blood cell, and we will see bite cells. Bite cells are the result of phagocytic removal of those Heinz bodies by your splenic macrophages. Now, just to wrap this up, do you remember which drugs are commonly known to precipitate hemolytic anemia in a case of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Think anti-TB drugs, sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, as well as primaquine or chloroquine. All right, next question. We got a multiple choice. As always, hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer.
right, the correct answer here is D. Let's talk about disorders of both fructose and galactose metabolism. So first up, we have essential fructosuria. This is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, and this is due to a deficiency of the fructokinase enzyme. Now, this is benign and typically asymptomatic, and it's characterized by the presence of fructose in the blood and the urine. Now, like I said, this is going to be asymptomatic, and the reason why is because hexokinase can just pick up the slack here and convert fructose into fructose 6-phosphate. Now, a more worrisome fructose-related condition is hereditary fructose intolerance. That is also inherited in an AR manner, but the deficiency is different. Here, it's caused by a deficiency of the aldolase B enzyme. As a result, we will see an accumulation of fructose 1-phosphate. That lowers the, the availability of, of phosphate and subsequently will inhibit gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Now, the way you're going to be able to identify this is by the onset of symptoms after uh, the patient eats anything that's rich in fructose, like fruit, fruit juice, or even honey. Now, don't forget that if they tell you in a vignette that the urine dipstick is negative, this is only because um, the urine dipstick is testing for glucose, not fructose. So it's kind of an irrelevant distractor. Now, since this is concerning, what symptoms do we need to look out for in a vignette? Well, I want you to keep an eye out for the symptoms of hypoglycemia, as well as vomiting. Um, some more severe and serious findings like jaundice and cirrhosis may also be seen. Now, in order to manage this, we need to decrease the patient's fructose intake, as well as avoid anything that can be converted into fructose, like sorbitol or anything that contains fructose, such as sucrose. Okay? Moving on to our disorders of galactose metabolism, we've got the galactokinase deficiency. This is also inherited in an AR manner, and this is caused by deficiency of the galactokinase enzyme. Now, as a result of an enzyme deficiency consisting of galactokinase, what's going to happen as a result is we will get an accumulation of galactocol if the patient is eating anything that contains galactose. Now, this is relatively benign, but it can result in infantile cataracts, as well as an inability to develop a social smile or track objects. Next up, we have classic galactosemia. This is also inherited in an AR manner, and this is caused by an absence of the galactose 1-phosphate urethral transferase enzyme. This causes an accumulation of toxic galactocol, especially in the lens of the eye. Now, you'll typically see this starting when the baby begins to feed. And the reason why is because we have lactose in both breast milk and formula, and lactose contains both glucose and galactose. Now, the characteristics of this condition are a failure to thrive, uh, jaundice, hepatomegaly, intellectual disability, and infantile cataracts. Now, an important association to keep in mind with this condition is the increased risk of E. coli-related sepsis in neonates. And the way you're going to treat this is by excluding both galactose and lactose from the diet. Now, the enzyme that converts galactose to galactocol, which is aldose reductase, is also responsible for trapping glucose in the cells by converting glucose into sorbitol. Now, certain tissues can take this sorbitol and convert it to fructose via sorbitol dehydrogenase, but some tissues have an insufficient amount of that enzyme, and that will result in trapping of sorbitol intracellularly, and its accumulation can cause osmotic damage which can manifest in ways like developing retinopathy, cataracts, a peripheral neuropathy. Okay, and don't forget that the retina, the kidneys, and the Schwann cells, they have alveolase reductase, but they lack sorbitol dehydrogenase, while the lens has primarily aldose reductase. Now, some structures like the liver, the ovaries, and the seminal vesicles have both of these enzymes. Lactase deficiency is also something you want to keep an eye out for, especially as someone gets older, because it leads to lactose intolerance. Now, an age-related decline in lactase is known as primary lactase deficiency, while a secondary cause would occur when the intestinal brush border becomes damaged, because that's where lactase turns lactose into glucose and galactose. Now, certain illnesses like autoimmune diseases or gastroenteritis can be responsible for causing a secondary lactase deficiency. Now, someone with a lactase deficiency, uh, or you know, they would say I'm lactose intolerant, would uh, have flatulence, bloating, cramping, and potentially even osmotic diarrhea. The way to fix this is quite easy. You have two options. A, you avoid foods with lactose, or you start um, taking lactase pills. Your choice depends how much you like milk products. All right, let's move on to the next question. It's a multiple choice. As always, hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer.
All right, the correct answer here is D. So when it comes to the urea cycle, you need to remember a few important things. First, this one happens in both the mitochondria and in the cytoplasm. And even more importantly, remember that the rate limiting step happens with the carbamoyl phosphate synthetase one enzyme and is activated by N-acetylglutamate and that this spe specific rate limiting step happens in the mitochondria. Now the production of carbamoyl phosphate from that rate limiting step combines with ornithine and is converted via the ornithine transcarbamoylase enzyme into citrulline, which then makes its way into the cytoplasm. Now, citrulline will then require aspartate and ATP to create arginosuccinate, and with the help of the arginosuccinate synthetase enzyme, creates arginosuccinate. Now from here, arginosuccinate lyase creates arginine and fumarate. Then arginine is combined with water and via arginase, makes ornithine and urea as a byproduct. Now, a deficiency of that rate-limiting ornithine transcarbamoylase enzyme will lead to a buildup of ammonia in the blood. And this enzyme deficiency is inherited in an X-linked recessive manner, and it results in a variety of consequences like lethargy, ataxia, asterixis, slowing of the speech, uh, and even death. Now, this is your most common urea cycle disorder, meaning it is most likely to be tested. And while it's inherited in an X-linked recessive manner, the other disorders of the urea cycle, they're all inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. So that's something to really keep in mind if you get a genetics-related question on your exam. You don't want to fall for this trap. So just remember that the most common one is the only one that's inherited, not in an AR manner, but it's X-linked recessive. Now, due to the increased levels of erotic acid that build up when this enzyme is deficient, you'll be able to find increased levels in the blood and in the urine. As well, you'll find a decrease in BUN and the symptoms of hyperammonemia, of course. Now, one of the ways by which you can differentiate this from erotic aciduria is by the fact that this does not cause megaloblastic anemia, while erotic aciduria does. Now, when ammonia levels increase, it's going to result in a change to the proportions to alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, GABA, and glutamine. And a decrease in those proportions will result in CNS toxicity and cerebral edema. That is as a result of the glutamine-induced osmotic shift that ensues. Now, the way hyperammonemia is managed is by limiting protein intake, as well as by giving certain medications that can actually lower the levels of ammonia in the body, such as lactulose. You can give certain antibiotics, uh, as well as drugs that can react with glycine or glutamine to form products that can then be easily excreted by the kidneys. Lactulose, which I just mentioned, is a commonly tested medication. And if you're asked about this, the way it works is by acidify acidifying the GI tract, which then traps those uh, ammonium the NH4 molecules so that they can be easily excreted. Okay, so if you're asked that question, keep that one in mind. I've seen this one pop up a lot over the years. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have a matching exercise, so go ahead and hit that pause button figure all of this out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answers. All right, here are all of the correct answers. Uh, if you need to fix anything, pause and go ahead and do so. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all this because it's right there in your books for you to see, but you want to make sure you know what creates what because by knowing this information, it'll help you to know those foundational aspects of more complex and challenging questions. So, for example, let's say you've got a question pointing to PKU and you're excited because you know everything about PKU, like the signs, the symptoms, the enzyme missing, etc. Well, what if they take it right back to the very basics and asked you about the substrates that will accumulate and that as a result will fail to make certain products? If you don't know that phenylalanine is the substrate to dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, you'll miss out on an easy point. So please make sure you know these pathways, all right? It's right there in your books. All right, let's take a break right there. I'll see you guys on the next lecture.